He began his professional career in healthcare administration. Today, he's a lifestyle coach. You may wonder what that is. Well, among other things, he helps people all around the world reverse lifestyle diseases such as heart disease and diabetes. You don't want to miss this. His name is Walt Cross. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is Our Conversation. Walt Cross, thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, sir. Today, you're a lifestyle coach. What's a lifestyle coach? It's a person who helps a person, another person, with uh, changing their lifestyle. A lot of times, it's not that person who just wants to change their lifestyle to change it, but they're coming in with health issues, and they're tired of the side effects or, th or the conventional not working, and they're looking for something that might work better. Okay, so the sorts of things you typically help people with, I mentioned, a diabetes. Yes. Diabetes can be reversed, yes or no? Oh, absolutely. By some or many or most people who suffer with uh, type we, 2 diabetes? We found over 98%. Okay. Heart disease can be effect, uh, uh, successfully treated, yes or no? Significantly, yes. Significant. No, we're not making blanket promises because no. it, it's not all created equal. Nothing's 100%. Okay. So, you, so what you hold, uh, the, the keys, if you like, to reversing lifestyle illnesses such as diabetes, heart disease, you say it can be done. You've seen it done? Absolutely. With repeatedly? Absolutely. Are you against conventional medicine? No. Okay. No, that's important we point that out because I don't want anybody thinking, oh, these are guys who are going to cure everything with acai berries and yes. don't want anybody to go to the doctor. That's not you? No. Okay. And you spent two decades in the conventional healthcare system as an administrator? Yes. Oh, fantastic. All right. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Yes. Let's find out about you. Yes. Sounds like you're kind of from around here. Yes, sir. So where are you from? I'm from Dunlap. Dunlap, Tennessee. Yeah, Squatchy. Not far from Dayton, Tennessee. That's right. Yeah. In the, what do you call that valley over there? Squatchy. The Sequatchie Valley. Yes. Okay. Okay. So you're in the Sequatchie Valley. You were raised there? Yes, sir. Until about how, how long? Well, then I lived there. Then I came to Chattanooga. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. To the promised land? <laughs> <laughs> how did you end up in healthcare administration? Was that always the plan? Or no. That... No. I wanted to go into architecture. Oh, yes. And my senior year in high school and looking, preparing for college and going to that uh, field, I realized you have to be able to be creative. Well, I don't have any of that ability. Oh, really? No. Yeah. So uh, I thought, well, what do I like next? And I liked health. I liked business. So I put them together and went into healthcare administration. Okay, where did you begin? I actually began in Tennessee. Oh, you did, yeah? And did it take you far? Or, or? Uh, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia. All right, so the Southeast? Yes, only you, the Southeast. You enjoyed that? I did, yeah? yes. What, what was stimulating, uh, rewarding about that? Helping people. Yeah? Yes. Okay, and you're helping, the, they're sick, they come in sick and go home either well or on their way to being well. That's that cool. has to be rewarding. It is. Did you ever feel like maybe you should have been a doctor? Uh, I thought of that, yes. You thought of that, yes. yeah. But God lead you in other ways. Yeah, you know, it takes a huge team. From dietary department to housekeeping, to, it takes everybody. It does, doesn't it? To make that, that system work. And so, as a, the doctor, just it's not just the doctor. The whole team has to come together. It's gotta be lab, it's gotta be therapies, it's gotta be all working together and then you have an outcome. What's the strength, or what are some of the strengths of the healthcare system as we know it today? What are some of the strengths? You know, the strength in, in American healthcare is our emergency medicine. Um, in chronic diseases, uh, I think we could do better. That's why I left, because I saw some outcome indicators that were better in lifestyle. But when you come to trauma, I think we do a good job. I wouldn't be original if I, were to, if, if I were to use the words, the healthcare system as we know it is broken. I didn't count it, but that's about 10 words. That wouldn't be original because everybody's talking about that. Politicians talk about it, got to fix healthcare, got to fix healthcare. Uh, this is a very subjective question. Is healthcare as we know it today fixable? It is fixable. Okay, how would you go about fixing? And, and I'm not gonna, we're not gonna do an entire overhaul of the sure. entire industry, but what sort of things would we look at to remedy uh, remedies. I think you have to look at root cause and correct root cause. Yeah. And then you have to look at, um, you know, what is the what is the focus? Is it financial or is it outcome focus? Healthcare is a business. It is. 
it's profit, profit and loss. Very much. So there has to be a financial focus. Yes. Got to pay the bills. You have to. How is that financial focus undoing some of the good that might otherwise be done? There are times that um, that we we cut into the um, into the muscle because of cost savings, and um, we're more concerned about the dollars than we are the uh, actual outcomes. Can be tough too because providing health care is an expensive business. Very much so. And uh, there's no end to technologies and treatments yes. and new machinery and new developments, and none of it's free. And drug companies charge a lot of money. I, I do want to point out, I don't believe that you would say that you're against all medications, and I'm certainly not against all medications. No. They save lives. They're, they're, they're a wonderful thing when they're wonderful. I've told my children raising them, take all the medications you need to take. So the healthcare system is, is, is wonderful. It's a, it's a behemoth. Uh, it has its challenges. It has its critics. I don't need to pile on to that today. And you spent a couple of decades working in the healthcare system. And then you thought you'd transition out of that and do something else. What was it you saw that you said, I could do that? I was driving down the road one morning. I prayed in my pickup truck to work every morning. And I was about halfway to work one morning. And as loud as you're talking right now, there was a voice. It said, go work in a sanitarium. And I said, God, I don't know that. You know, I know conventional health care. I don't know sanitarium. And I argued a bit. Two weeks later, going the same way, past the same little community, the voice was, go work in a sanitarium. You heard a voice. Oh, it's a voice just as loud as your Actual voice. voice. Yes. Well. Yes. So what did you do? Well, I had just finished reading a book called Ministry of Healing. It's a good book. And I was comparing what we were doing versus what it said in that book. And then I found out there's lifestyle programs. And so I started doing research and um, went and there's a lifestyle center that had a position open as director. And I went and took the job. Where was that? It was in Virginia. A lifestyle center, you, and that was it. You left your place of employment. I did. And days or weeks later, you're in another place. Yes. That had to be in a very foreign sort oh, of environment yes. for you to dive headfirst into. It was. Huh. Yes. And what type of treatments were you working with in this new location? Mostly diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Okay. And to tell you, it was really strange. I get there and they only fed their, their, their diabetics breakfast and dinner. Now I'm from here, you know, dinner's the noon meal. Yeah. And um, I can remember going in and, and telling the physicians, you know, you got to fix, you got to fix these folks' supper. You got to have a morning snack, an afternoon snack, an HS snack. And the one of the physicians said, he decided to play with me, and he said, "Why?" I said, "Standard practice. You know, it's the American. You know, it's what the American Dietetic Association recommends." And then they asked me one more question. They said, "How many diabetics do you reverse where you came from uh -huh. in 20 years?" Zero. Zero. And they had over a 98 percent reversal rate. So I want to repeat this because this is bona fide. You're not making this up. We could talk to half a dozen or a dozen or two dozen or ten dozen people who'd validate what you say. When a diabetic goes to his or her doctor or is admitted to the hospital like my oldest brother recently was, mm -hmm. there's no thought of winding that all the way out, of reversing the diabetes. Treat the diabetes. Now, I think we ought to point out too, there's a difference between type one and type two diabetes. That's, and that's significant. If, you, if you're born with diabetes, that can be a horse of a different color. Adult onset type two diabetes, very, very treatable. Yes. So the hospital you go to isn't gonna try to fix your diabetes, but it'll do a pretty good job of managing it. Yes. And that's significant. You went into an environment where diabetes was being reversed. Yes. No more insulin. Gone. No more medication of any kind. Gone. Why are hospitals not doing this? There may be three or four or five reasons. They could. I mean, you can, you can fix someone's diabetes in a hospital just as well as you can in a lifestyle center. Why are not hospitals doing this? You know, I think there's a perception. When I left, I told corporate I was leaving to a, a place that reversed type 2 diabetes, and they told me I was crazy. 
They said, well, you're crazy. You're going to ruin your reputation. And I said, we can even, even significantly improve type 1. And they said, you're stupid. And so I think there's a just um, a belief that this is what we have and it's not fixable. The research isn't out there saying it's reversible, even though we have come a long ways in the last 22 years yeah, since I left yeah, yeah. in the conventional health care. How can someone who's well-educated, these people have MBAs, how can they force their head so far into the sand to ignore evidence-based outcomes. These aren't crackpots making unsubstantiated claims. This is verifiable and the science backs it up. Why then do you think, I can understand other reasons, but why would there be ignorance among some? I'll be careful I don't offend every last friend I have who works in healthcare, because as I said, we respect the healthcare system, we thank God for it. But they're not rolling diabetes back, they're, they're, they're sticking needles in your arm and, and, and so forth. How can, that, how can that kind of ignorance exist? I think one is you're jumping out of standard of practice. Okay. There's always a little fear involved there. There is. Um, when you step out of standard of practice, you don't have the, um, from a liability standpoint. And there we have it. I mean, you know, if, if something goes wrong with insulin metformin, you've got 50 doctors you can bring in the courtroom and, and say, I'd do the exact same thing. Yeah. When you step outside of standard of practice, you got a family to take care of. That's right. Yeah. Or even more so today is a lot of physicians don't work for themselves. They work for groups. And so it's you know, they can't just step out and do that because the group wouldn't agree with it. So so there's that um, the standard of practice, um, the system as we know it, there's gotta be an element of protecting the system. Uh, and then I wonder this. Not everybody wants to go to a lifestyle center for a week or two or three and have their diabetes reversed. There is no shortage of people living in the United States who want a pill or an injection. Don't bother me with this other foolishness. Tons of people like that. Physician friend of mine, he was in West Virginia. He had a friend, no, not a friend, a patient. And he said to the patient, you know, Ed, I'll call him Ed, Really, all you need to do is drink more water and walk around the block once a day. You'll be fine. Yes. That's all you need to do. And yes. Ed said, doctor, are you going to give me a pill? That's right. Or am I going to go find me another doctor who That's will? exactly right. He wrote him a prescription and sent him on his it's way. It's true. So we have That's it a big part of it. Both sides, right? Yeah, we do. Reluctance on the part of people. So you're dealing with diabetes. And I said before I would ask you this, I would ask you to explain to me how diabetes may be reversed. How does that happen? The key is root cause. Root cause. Yes. If, if I have, say, a piece of sandpaper and I'm rubbing my arm, yeah. what's going to happen to the skin? Yeah, nothing good. It's going to rip the hide off of it. Yeah. And you say, well, Walt, let me put some medicine on there. And you put medicine on there. And then you leave and I go to rubbing it again. And then you come back and say, oh, you need some medicine on there. Yes, it needs. It's hurting. I'm down to the bone. And you put more medicine, then is it going to heal? Yeah, no. You got to get rid of the cause. Yes. Get, and so you've got. When we look at diseases, we've got to look at the physiology. What is the cause? A surgeon once told me he was the top surgeon in Philadelphia in his field, and he said, "Walt, you got to do four things to reverse disease. Number one, you've got to identify the organ or organs that are caught, you know, dealing with that primary concern. Then you've got to identify the organs." or systems that may affect that. Let's say it's stress. Okay. Which, which organ is that? It's the brain. Sure. So are there other organs or systems that can affect brain function? Cardiovascular, um, uh, digestive, that, number two. So then you have to look at, then you have to take away anything which may harm any of those organs or systems. It could be diet, it could be lack of sleep, it could be dehydration. It could be smoking or alcohol, illicit drug, whatever it may be. And then he says, you've got to give those organs and systems what they need to run well. And he says, you cure disease. It's pretty simple when you boil it down like that. Yes, and it was true. And that's what I use on a daily basis. So as we talk about diabetes, um, you've, you've, you're, we have thousands of trillions of cells actually in our mm -hmm. body. And around your cells, you have insulin receptors. And, and what happens is uh, insulin opens the door and allows glucose into the cell. Everybody's happy. 
three things I found that can cause that door not to work too well on that insulin receptor, and people then become insulin resistant. Number one, if the cell gets too big, the door just doesn't work as well. You know, in the wintertime when you try to go open the door and it kind of sticks a little oh, yeah. on you? Yeah. Okay. So the door gets too big. Number two, if there's too much fat. And number three, if there's too much inflammation. So you have to remove those three things. So if the cell's too big, what do you do? You just shrink it. How do you shrink a cell? Go to ideal body weight. All right. It's that simple. Just like that. But you may have a person that's like you and they still have type 2 diabetes. So there's other reasons. You can be ideal body weight and still have type 2 diabetes. So the next one is too much fat. Now, you've been here a few years in the South and you know we like to fry everything. Maters, taters, ice cream, pickles, cheese, pick, chick, picking, you know, chickens, uh, ochre, whatever. Yeah, it's always we good fry it. fried. Oh. And if we don't fry it, we put oil in it. That fat, dairy, meat, it clogs that receptor. So you go to a, a diet for a time being, I call it the restoration diet to okay. restore the body. Kind of like restoring a car. You've got to, uh, you know, grind off the, the rust and, you know, put the bondo and, and grind, sand it and all that kind of thing. And then once you're done, you don't have to keep taking the grinder to it. But for this short period of time, we take fats away. So that God's, God is so cool. You know, just as he forgives us for our sins, he forgives us for our sins the way we treat our body. Right. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it's fantastic. And, and so what happens is when you take that fat out of the diet, on a special diet we do, then it cleans out that fat in those cells and that receptor starts working again. The third one is the inflammation. And inflammation could be sleep deprivation. Harvard says the number one cause of inflammation, processed foods. Mm. So you take those three things away, boom. It's gone. You're finally giving the body a fighting chance, aren't you? Exactly. Yeah. So what, what you're doing with life coaching and health counseling, if you like, you're helping people to reason from cause to effect. Is that right? It's true. Yeah. Helping to see the root cause of what they're doing. Yes. And you've found that the vast majority of times you do that, what happens? The diabetes goes away. I mean, blood sugar comes normal, but you have to be careful because You've got to work with your doctor or a healthcare person, or unless you know, you know, slide and scale. But what happens is, as you're doing this, as you ch change that diet, as you start, and this is also cool. I noticed that my patients, I'd sit down with them in the morning at six o'clock, and let's say you come in with a blood sugar of 180, 190, and I'd send you for a power walk for um, for um, um, 30 minutes, and you come back, and it'd be 120. Maybe mm. 130. I thought, that's interesting. So I mentioned to a buddy of mine over at Loma Linda Medical School in California. He said, that's interesting. He was a professor over there. Two years later, I saw him. He said, well, you know what you told me two years ago? We did some studying on that. He says, we found that a, just a 20-minute power walk lowers the blood sugar more than one shot of insulin. Isn't that cool? That's fantastic. So we have people exercise four times a day, just 20 minutes, four times a day, you know, and drink adequate water, go to bed on time. And what we find is is that blood sugar starts coming down. And so you've got to measure your blood sugar every day. And so when you see that number start coming down, you say, hey doc, I'm doing this new diet and my blood sugar's coming on down. How do I need to adjust that? And your, your physician will help you adjust that. Yeah, yeah. I like the idea too of, 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 of someone keeping in touch with a physician. Absolutely. It keeps it safe and scientific and exactly. should keep everybody happy. Fantastic, there's much more to know. I'm gonna find out about heart disease and more in just a moment. With Walt Cross, I'm John Bradshaw. This is Conversations, brought to you by It Is Written. Hello, I'm Dr. David DeRose, a specialist in internal medicine and preventive medicine. And I've been surprised over the years in working with patients and studying the medical research literature just how powerful hemorrheology is when it comes to health. You may be wondering, what is hemorrheology? Well, I call it the Methuselah Factor, and that's the title of my book. The Methuselah Factor really helps you connect with things that can help your blood be more fluid. You say, why is that important? It's important because it can help you decrease your risk of a stroke or a heart attack, even lower your risk of cancer. But it's a whole lot more than just preventing killer diseases. If you improve your blood fluidity, your mind will work better. You'll perform physically better and 
you'll decrease your risk of dementia. So don't hesitate. Dive into the Methuselah Factor. Make a difference in your life and the life of those that you love. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. My guest is Walt Cross. He's a life coach or a lifestyle coach. He's the man who can help you when you're dealing with lifestyle diseases and more. Walt, before we're done, I'm going to be sure that I ask you about fanaticism because while we're talking about good lifestyle principles, there's no shortage of people who go off the deep end for a variety of reasons. Some are wired that way. Some get bad advice. Some just stop thinking rationally. And we don't want to encourage people to do that. But before we get to that, we talked about diabetes. I think you spoke very, I think, uh, helpfully, very expertly about how diabetes functions and how we can turn that backwards. Another thing that you deal a lot with, heart disease. Heart disease is probably a slightly more complicated animal in terms of the uh, maybe more causes and maybe greater impact around the body. Perhaps I'm not entirely accurate in saying that. But it's a, it's a different animal. Explain what heart disease is. My recollection is that somewhere north of 600,000 Americans die every year from cardiovascular disease. It's the number one cause of death. It's a huge number. What is it? I know it's, it, it's, it's a big thing, but break it down for me. Well, when you look at cardiovascular disease, you look at, there's a number of issues. Yeah. You know, you know does a person have hypertension? Does a person have atherosclerosis, or arteriosclerosis? Uh, do they have uh, issues of electrical issues, you know, arrhythmias, do they have? So you gotta identify, again, going back to the cause, the cure is in the cause. And so you, you've gotta identify what the cause, let's look at hypertension. Hypertension, um, number one cause I'm finding with hypertension is stress. Stress raises cortisol, stress lowers potassium. You, you've, got, um, uh, you've got hypertension. It could be because of dehydration. De there's a number of reasons dehydration affects um, uh, high blood pressure. Uh, are they outside of ideal body weight? Uh, that can cause a lot of research on, on that causing hypertension. Uh, do they have poor kidney function? The kidneys are the switches that regulate the blood pressure. And so if you don't take care, of, if you're having kidney issues and don't take care of the kidneys, you're a good chance you're gonna have hypertension. Is it too much sodium? Is it because you have clogged arteries? You know, if you have a, a, a hole this big in your garden hose and you go down to this small, so you have, you're gonna have more pressure. Yeah. So if you, if you close that lumen in, you're gonna increase the pressure. Is it, hard, is it hardening the arteries? You know, if you, every time the pump pumps, the, the pipe goes like this, then, then the pressure won't be bad. But if you go rigid, then your inside pressure is gonna go up because it doesn't do this anymore. Or is it heart issues? So there's a number of things that cause hypertension. And so you want to find which one it is and then fix what's causing it. If it's an issue of, um, you know, um, let's say it's electrical, you want to figure out what's going on there. There's some, some things that can help with the electrical. But the big issue out there that I find in cardiovascular is diet. Um, a lot of folks just don't eat a healthy diet, especially here in the South. And, um, and if you eat a more, as, as um, Cornell University has found, Cambridge University has found, even Cleveland Clinic will tell you, and Cleveland Clinic has an excellent cardiovascular program. And they have found that if you'll eat a, a whole food, plant-based diet with variety, three things, and Harvard is very sticky on this, just like Cornell is, it's gotta be var variety. We're not dogs, same old, same old. We need variety for different nutrients. But it's not just plant-based. Uh, Fruit Loops are plant-based. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's Oreos right. are plant-based. Plant yeah, French fries are yeah. vegan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's gotta be whole food, plant-based with variety. That is huge, huge on changing cardiovascular function. And then you then add in, is there adequate exercise? Hey, let yeah. me interrupt you and back up. Whole food, mm -hmm. plant-based, that's not very hard. It's not. It's not very, I mean, really. No. What, what does that mean? And, and I don't wanna, we're not even gonna use the word salad unless somebody <laughs> storms out of the room in disgust. Yeah. What does that mean? If, if I were e eating the typical sad standard American diet and wanted to start 
transitioning to a whole foods, plant-based diet, what sort of changes would I begin to make in my life? Easy, baby steps. What would yeah. I start doing? Well, first of all, look at what you're eating. A lot of folks, you know, they write down what you're eating now and look at the, the volume of variety. Yeah, garbage and not much variety. Let's <laughs> just say that. And so what I have, I have a sheet of paper. Is that, that question comes up. Well, I'm not a rabbit. Yeah, there you go. And so I have a piece of paper that has just a huge list of fruit. Now, when I go to Africa, let me tell you what. The African food is huge. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, it, it taste buds just go. And I was I've never had before. Papua New Guinea, yeah. and, and we ate a pineapple. Oh yeah. And I've eaten pineapple before. Yeah. But this was like going from black and white TV to to 4K Absolutely. color. It was the difference is unbelievable. Yeah. Have yeah. you had Have you had tree tomatoes? Oh, tamarillos, yes, in New Zealand they had them. Oh, they're yeah. great. You don't eat, them when they're, don't eat them when they're not ripe because they'll okay. turn you inside out. They're yeah. fabulous things. They are. And yeah. so when you look at all these types of fruit, it's amazing. Yeah, it's it. there are all sorts of stuff. Yeah. There is. And then I have a list of all kinds of vegetables. There's a lot of vegetables. That's right. And then I have all these nuts, then all these seeds, um, and, and all these grains. There's a lot of variety there. Yeah. And so... What you don't want to do is when you start eating this whole food plant-based diet, and I'm not a vegan. I got I got leather shoes here. Oh, look at that! Yeah, yes, so, you do. Yeah. And I've got a leather you know belt uh, in my regular pants, yeah. and so I'm not vegan. And and so vegan don't do anything with any animals. I'm plant-based. All right. And so when you look at all the variety there, there's a lot of variety of food, and so you just add a little at a time, and and so let's say you're you know a morning breakfast might be. Folks pop, tell me. Pop tarts, eating pop tarts and a cup of coffee. Or they swing into the fast food on the way to yeah, work. Oh. And I say, listen, we can still do fast food. Fast food's okay. Here's how you do fast food. So the night before, you get you a poke. You know what a poke is? No. A little brown bag. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Yes, yes. I do understand. Yeah. And so, and Grandma then you, used to you, talk about poke. Yeah. And so you then put, say, a banana, an apple. Don't do a, a, a pear. It gets a little messy. It can get messy. And then get you some grapes. And then uh, get you some walnuts, maybe some almonds, put it in that bag. And then when you run out the door the next morning, grab it, and in drive time, you can eat that. That was fast. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's not going to mess you up, but it's healthy food, and yeah. that's fast food. Yeah, that's yeah. healthy fast food. Start out with that. And then as you can, add some oatmeal. Add some grits. Now, some of y'all's folks may not know what grits are. Well, they ought to. Yeah, they should, yeah. especially the yellow grits. They are really good. No, they're good. I grew up with white grits, but yeah. yellow white grits. grits are good. Yeah, they are. I've but yellow grits are even better. Yeah. And so, you know, there's quinoa, there's couscous, there's all mm -hmm. kinds of grains. And then when you go to the noon meal, which we call dinner, and, um, you know, you've, you've got your salad, yeah, but... I mean, put all kinds of stuff in there, not just lettuce, but you know, you're putting, uh, you're putting uh, uh, celery and cucumbers and broccoli and cauliflower, put some okra in there. Mm -hmm. and, and you can put the different foods in there, but you can eat some beans and, and, and some, you know, many vegetables you can put in there. Yeah. And so there's just, look at that huge list of a variety of foods. By the way, speaking of okra, uh, before we began here, yes. I, I, we mentioned okra in conversation, and you 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 earned my undying <laughs> respect because I asked you a question. I've asked many people. You're the only person ever to give me the right answer when I asked you what's the best way to eat okra, and you responded by saying, "It's raw. Eat it raw. Yeah, right off the plant. It's fantastic. This long. Perfect. Yeah, that that's long. great. But you know what? I've got to tell you this." I mentioned to Walt that if you really want to do okra good, you make up a little peanut sauce <laughs> and dip that okra in the peanut, raw okra in peanut sauce. It's like nothing else. This stuff is fantastic. So plant more okra next year, particularly if you're in the South, it grows like weeds, easy to grow, <laughs> and you get some peanut sauce or not, and you'll be a happy camper. So, so it doesn't have to be boring, does it? No, and, and by no. introducing these, these steps, is it okay to go slow or do I need to dive in the deep end? You know, it depends on how, what's the acuity. You know, as you talk about cardiovascular disease, you know, do you have an ejection fraction of 20, 25, 30? Then you need to jump in pretty fast. But uh, if you just want to change over, change over slowly if you want to. Uh, start, try this dish, try that. You know, Melody Prettyman, uh, you know Melody, Chef Melody. You've mm -hmm. got uh, Mark Anthony, Chef Ma Mark Chef Anthony. You've got plenty of cookbooks out there. Oh, yeah, Fake you Kazi's can, got a great book yeah. to sell, and, and Karen Lynch. And, oh, yes. Yeah. And so try some of those cookbooks. Just add something in. Just keep throwing it in. Yeah, can't go wrong.
Yes. So heart disease, I, I think I might have pulled you up short earlier on a question and, and asked you to drill down about heart disease, but that's okay. So you are finding, okay, what sort of results do you see? I've heard the stories about the, the, the fellow who was so unwell, uh, so unhealthy, he couldn't walk to his mailbox to get the mail and walk back inside. He, he simply couldn't do it. And then after a program like the one you're talking about, before too long, he was walking two, four, six miles in a day. Yes. No problem. Yes. What's, what, tell me some stories about what you've seen actually transpire in a person's life who has implemented changes. A year ago, mm -hmm. um, my wife, about a year and a half, knew something was wrong. And um, we started checking it out, ended up going to UAB, University of Alabama, Birmingham. Your my ejection fraction is probably 65. 60, 65, that's, that's when you have that left ventricle. It's a fraction of how much blood it sucks in, squirts out. Mm -hmm. And uh, hers was a 10, 15, barely moving. And so they went in, they wanted to look at it, and they, you know, they said, oh, it's probably just need a stent. And they went in and they said, oh, it's squeaky clean. Now here's a person who's you know, got a squeaky clean one. They went in and they found there's some damage in there. And they said, that's only caused by a drug. Have you ever taken this drug? She says, yes, 44 years ago when I oh, had chemotherapy. Well. And so they whisk her from the, from the Kirkland Clinic straight over to the heart transplant unit and put her right there. And they were looking at possibly, you know, looking at a heart transplant. Uh, they said there was nothing could be done other than, you know, uh, they said if we left her like she was, she wouldn't make a year. She would die. Let's point out this is UAB. Yes. This, this is a decent... Right. Yeah, a, they, it's an excellent cardiac well unit. Well-renowned yes. hospital. Yes. And so um, we stayed there a little bit. And um, so I said, you know, let's see what we can do with lifestyle. Um, I left her today, and she was working away at, at the store. Uh, her ejection fractions come back. Uh, no, it's not a 60, 65 yet, but it's improving. And, um, and so... <sighs> Not only is there just lifestyle. I mean, she had a good lifestyle. She broke the record. They've never seen a person go. Normally, she took a drug called the Red Devil. It's adromycin. And they used it for chemotherapy when she was 15. And um, normally, it's within 10 years, the heart stops. Maybe 24, 25, but that's the longest they've ever had. 20, 44 is the longest. It's well, based on her lifestyle. Yeah. But even in that acute situation, um, can we do natural? And so, I mean, she was already eating a healthy diet. She was already exercising. She was already going to bed on time. She was already drinking her water. So what do you do? We added some herbs. And Just so, that? Yes. Well, no, no, no. Something more important. Yeah, I know. Prayer. Yeah. God does the healing. And so we added some, some herbal things and some uh, supplements, you know, the magnesium and different things. And she's doing great. How did you know what herbs and supplements to add? Well, you've got to look and see what does it need? And then what's out there that God has given us that can do it? And so science is important. Um, I believe God is big in science. Sure, no question. He created He's science. He's the God of science. And so you can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater, you right. know? And so you look at what, you go to NIH, National Institute of Health, and you look at what natural things are out there that will fix this problem or do the same thing that maybe they're hoping this drug would or whatever, and you start applying mm, those. Mm -mm. Well, praise the Lord. That seemed to work out really well. Yeah. Hey, you, you mentioned back at the store. That she's, she's at the store today. So tell me about the store. What's the store? Yeah, we have a health food store. Well, you do? We do. Uh, we had a deli until she had some challenges. Well, she's not back up to an EF of 60 yet, so I told her she can't open it back until, because she runs, she's like the ever ready bunny, you know? Right. She goes and she goes until she falls down. Um, but we have a health food store and uh, people come in with, uh, it could be, I mean, one lady, when I was teaching a stop smoking clinic one time, a lady calls and I, they bring the phone to me. She says, her name's Karen. She says, Karen, I think my little boy broke his arm. I said, Karen, you need to go to the emergency room. Well, I need you to look at it first. I said, I don't have x-ray vision, but come on by. And it's, it's angulated and go to the emergency room. So people come by with a lot of health issues. Yeah. And we do get those people who come in and say, you know, uh, I want to change my diabetes. I want to get rid of diabetes. I want to get rid of cardiovascular disease. And, and I start talking about it. they need to cut out the hog jowl and the chitlins and the biscuits and gravy. And that kind of is a problem. And well, no, they don't want to do that. Yeah. But that's their choice. You know, God allows us choice. And so um, you've, you've got to get rid of the cause. And that unhealthy diet 
has a big impact on that diabetes. Here's the thing, though. There's a reason people eat garbage. No, it tastes good. Yeah. Cultural? It's cultural, big time. It tastes good. Yeah, culture's huge. But I tell you, man, healthy food doesn't taste bad. It's delicious. It's fantastic, particularly if you know what you're doing. You yeah, know, train the tongue. And you learn. Yeah, that, that's right. You can learn. I remember when I was brand new Christian, going to church, and had a fellowship meal, and this little girl, and it was Keisha, I'll never forget her name. Keisha was eating green olives. I said, oh, you eat those things? And she looked at me with a smile. She said, mm, they're so nice. And I thought, no, if a five-year-old girl can eat green olives, and so can I. When I came to the United States, everywhere you go, you know, there's um, cilantro, particularly mm. if you're at a Mexican oh, place, yeah, there's cilantro and there's salsa. Yeah. And I despise mm. cilantro. I figured if I'm going to eat salsa, I've got to figure out yeah. the cilantro thing. I just, I chose to like it, and now I like it as much as I like Put it. Put it in black beans. It's delicious. Yeah, yeah, you use it in many ways. So you can train the taste buds. You can. I just don't like, well, maybe there's that one in a million thing you're never going to get over it. But by and large, yeah, you can. You can like what you tell yourself you're going to sure. like, right? Yeah. So there are some barriers to people making, making good decisions. We need to talk about the role of faith in adopting lifestyle practices, the role of the Holy Spirit. Um, so we'll talk about some of those things in a moment, but we've got about a minute and a half. Tell me what another couple of things, lifestyle issues that maybe people aren't aware that yeah. lifestyle change can really impact. You got about a minute. Yeah, sleep is a huge one. You know, people, you know, they think, well, oh, I can get by on four hours sleep. I can get no by on can. six hours sleep, you know. Yeah. And we're now learning that, you know, your lymphatic system, well, when I was in school, we didn't know, you know, you know, we took anatomy and physiology and biology and chemistry, all those courses. We did not know that the brain had a lymphatic system. It's called the glymphatic system. Mm -hmm. And we just found that out, you know, in uh, around 2013, 20. Actually, your friend Brad uh, is the one that taught me, Brad Envy. So? Yes. Yeah. And so we find that the, you know, when you go to bed around nine o'clock, that the brain does a deep cleaning. And then from about 10 till nine to 10, and then from 10 to midnight, it does a thorough cleaning and flushing. And if you're not asleep, it's not working too well. And they thought it was only just going to bed those hours before midnight, which the hours before midnight, we know were twice the hours after midnight. Yeah. But they've now found that even exercise turns on the glymphatic system. But Harvard says this, even though we thought that only going to bed by those hours before midnight you can turn on the glymphatic system. We have found there is something else that turns on the glymphatic system. But, bold letters, red, you need to do both, and that's uh, exercise. There you go. Two separate ways turns on the glymphatic. And sleep, sleep is imperative. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, but it's be. three things. You got the hours of sleep, then the hours before midnight, and then you need good sleep that you stay asleep so you get that REM sleep. Mm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. I said there's a couple of things we're going to ask you about in a moment, and we will, and I hope you... Hang around to join us. I'm having a good time. Here's Walt Cross and I'm John Bradshaw. More of our conversation in just a moment. Just a few hundred years ago, the Bible was not available to everyday people. Today, it's everywhere. What happened to bring the Word of God to the world? Join me for part two of Ancient Wisdom, Present Power as archaeologist and theologian Dr. Michael Hazel takes us back in time to the events that led to the Bible being propelled to the forefront of Western society and then the world. We'll look together at a remarkable collection of rare books that tell the story of the advance of the gospel, of the battle between truth and tradition, of the life and death struggle between darkness and light, featuring artifacts of historical importance and insights that will grow and encourage your faith in God. Ancient Wisdom, Present Power, telling the story of some of the greatest events in human history and the development of the greatest story ever told. Don't miss part two of Ancient Wisdom, Present Power, brought to you by It Is Written TV. Welcome to Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. Was it God's plan for sin to enter the world? Is the building of a temple necessary before Jesus returns? That's a good question. And I think we've got a pretty good answer for you here. Temptation is not sin. God says, put me to the test.
Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. My guest is lifestyle coach Walt Cross. What we've spoken, I think, at length about diabetes, heart disease, how these things can be reversed. There's something I want to caution, though. It seems to me the minute you start talking about taking a whole foods, plant-based approach to disease, that there might be someone who says, if I just drink more carrot juice, I can get rid of my duodenal ulcer or my, or my brain tumor. And there are some people who tend to take even good things too far or go into something unwisely. Talk to me about the dangers of that. How do we avoid going crazy with this stuff? You know, you asked me a question at first. You know, what did I think about pharmaceuticals? Did I agree with pharmaceuticals? Sure. I believe that our study should be into physiology. And as we understand physiology, we change lifestyles. And with the change of lifestyles, adding lifestyles, we don't have to use some of those pharmaceuticals. Oh, yeah, nearly as much, yeah. Yes, and so we should do we should use less and less pharmaceuticals because we know the side effects, we know those issues. And so as we start applying the science-based physiology, then our body, we then have, we, we start moving from this side over to this side. Now mm. in fairness, I'll just jump in and say this, don't, don't, yes. don't lose your place. Yes. I have friends, cardiologists who are so, you know, they're totally committed to natural remedies, mm -hmm. natural approach to yeah. illness, but they'll still, prescribe drugs for heart disease in some cases because they say these folks just need it. So there are times, there are times, and I don't want anybody to think that we are saying no drugs ever because that would, that would be reckless, I think. Yes. But you're, you're speaking in general terms and I think we can yes. understand that and should exactly. appreciate that very much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. proceed. Yeah. So as we, you know, we have to study physiology. You know, how does the body work? Yeah. Well, my daddy taught me how a tractor worked. You know, I grew up on a farm up on Kegel Mountain. Um, and then he taught me how a car worked. And, you know, and, and you, know, you know, you don't squall the tires, you don't, you know, you don't race the engine and you change your oil every once in a while and, you know, every 3,000 miles and you rotate your tires every 6,000 miles. You know what your daddy taught you. Yeah. The same thing's true with our body. Right, that's right. And so as you take care of your car, you need to learn the physiology of the body. There's a great deal of ignorance about how the body works. Yeah. Kids aren't being taught today, and so they're pouring things in and abusing their bodies in a thousand different ways. Just didn't know yes. that all French fries all the time will one day come back to bite you. Just didn't know. Yeah. So that understanding physiology, very big thing. Yeah. And I found there's a key. Do you remember taking a test in school? And you took the test. And yeah, the, I remember that with trepidation. Oh, but yeah, yeah. I, I hated yeah. the red pen, you know. And so the teacher had this master that they would sit down, it had holes punched in it, and they'd look, and anywhere they didn't say my black mark, they'd yeah. put their red mark. Well, there is a master I have found, and it really, really works. And can I share that master with oh, you? Oh, yeah, I'd love it if you would. I had this couple come in to see me from Knoxville several years ago. They both worked in healthcare They're in their mid-60s, and they were having some health issues. And uh, the wife went to the bathroom, the husband was sitting there, and he's looking at this poster I have of those that master and he's just staring at it and he finally goes that is the key to health I said what are you talking about he said those items there are the key to health he says I worked in healthcare my whole career that's the key mm. well that's these eight basic things and that is the fuel you put in your body yep. the food it, the exercise do you exercise or not do you have adequate amount of water? Is it hydrated? You know, I have people come in and they say, I don't do water. They don't do water? No, I don't do water. What do they drink? Oh, Mountain Dew, Pepsi. Are they getting sunshine? There's people who just don't go outside. You know, they work inside and they live inside and they don't, they do this all day long yeah. inside and they're not outside. Sunshine's very important. Mm -hmm. Fresh air is important. And then temperance. I call that making the right decisions. It, and it's not just I don't do alcohol, drugs, and, and, and tobacco. It might be right decisions on what you're watching, what you're listening to, what you're reading, um, the conversations you're in. 
making the right decisions. And then yes, fresh air, diaphragmic breathing, rest. Are you getting that good sleep we talked about a few minutes ago? But the most important. What's that? Trust in God, because God does the healing. All that we talked about before, it's God blesses that. Just like when we sit down at the table and you, and you sit there, that apple's not gonna keep you alive, but you ask God to bless that apple. Mm -hmm. And then he blesses it and it keeps you alive. And so we gotta do all eight. You gotta do all those seven I mentioned, plus you gotta trust him and he blesses that. And I find when I add those eight things, also along with learning about physiology, you know, and, but it still comes usually within that eight. You know, am I staying up late? What's the physiology of staying up late? What's the physiology of drinking Mountain Dews? Well, drink water. What's the physiology of eating, you know, biscuits and gravy versus the diet we talked about? People aren't thinking from cause to effect. If you just think about what happens to my body when I eat this steak. Yes. What yes. happens? What happens when I drink this Mountain Dew or this milkshake or this radish, whatever it might be? How does this impact me? When you start to think about it, yes. that bag of candy that I grabbed off the shelf in the gas station when I went in to pay for my fuel, I wonder if I really needed to eat that whole thing on the drive home from work. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so you have gone beyond just advising people about their health. Lots of people do that, physicians do that, they do a great job of it. We love our doctors, thank mm -hmm. God for them nurses and nurse practitioners, and you're none of those things. Back to what I was saying, you've gone beyond merely, merely might be the wrong word, advising people about their health. For you, this is ministry. You connect this to faith. Yes. Like a right arm is connected to the body. Yes. Why do you do that, and how do you see the benefits of doing that? I think there's two reasons. You know, let's say I want to go out that door over there and my arms are behind my back. How do, how do I get through that door? Yeah. Well, I can go through like a bull in a china closet. The body is the gospel. The hand is the door that opens that and allows the gospel to go in there carefully. Can I tell you a real quick story? Oh yeah, I hope you will. This lady comes in one time, and I was sitting down with a man and his wife. They'd moved in from California, and he had diabetes, and I was helping him there. Merely comes over, and she says, you need to help this lady a minute, and, and excuse me just a minute. So I told him, excuse me, and I went over, and she is squalling. You know what squalling is. She is crying. Mm. And she said, um, my husband, they've told me, is going to die. He has, um, he has, you know what MRSA is? Yeah. Well, he had vancomycin resistant, which is, that's even worse. Yeah. And uh, the physician had given him a, a severity of 10 of 10. Oh. She'd gone, to, she'd gone over to a CVS pharmacy next door and uh, across the street and was begging them for dr another drug to help. And they said, ma'am, your doctors use everything. There's nothing else we can use as a drug. And they said, go see Walt across the street, see if he can help you. So she came across the street and she says, can you help my husband? And I said, well, there's something I've used for MRSA. It worked extremely well for MRSA. Blows the doors off vancomycin. I said, but he has vancomycin resistant and he's very serious she, because I knew what he had, what she said. I said, I've never used it for that, but are you willing to try? She says, I'll try anything. I want my husband to stay alive. I said, okay. So I went and got something, brought it back. And I said, now, does your husband believe in God? She says, nope. I said, do you believe in God? She says, nope. And I said, well, the only way this is gonna work is if God blesses it. Do you mind if I pray and ask God to bless it? She says, I told you, I'll do anything to keep my husband alive. Huh. I said, okay. So I prayed, Mary Lou prayed, asked God to bless this, that it would help her husband. It's okay, and she left. Two weeks later, she comes back. Oh, she was smiling. I mean, she was smiling from ear to ear, and she says, the doctor just told us it's a four out of 10 in severity. Boom. It was she, a 10 out of 10. Yes, it was 10 of 10. She left. One week later, she comes back. I mean, she is crazy excited. And she said, it's gone. The disease is gone, plum gone, the infection. And then she tells me this. She says, my husband now believes in God. Oh, really? 
See how it works? Yeah, that's a great See, story. I didn't say I could make him better. I yeah. didn't say what I gave would fix him. I said only God could fix him. And she said he believes in God. Boom, she was gone. This was in 2005, two years ago. I was up by, we have a huge herb cabinet. We do herbs. And uh, this lady comes in. She says, my husband wants to quit smoking. Anything to help him? To help him with getting the desire away? I said, sure. I said, take a fourth of a cup of, of, uh, of um, honey. Your Manuka honey could oh, work. yeah, that's a good um, stuff. Uh, Three-fourths of a cup of lemon juice and a third of a teaspoon of peppermint essential oil. Mix it up and have him take a nip anytime he gets a hanker. Now, for some folks, a nip is a little drink, and yeah. a hankering is a desire for. There you We're, go. She's a country I'm lady. Glad we have you here to translate. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And she goes, okay, great. She writes it down. She he- starts to head out the door, and I said, but wait, don't forget the most important thing. And she says, what's that? The peppermint? I said, no, prayer. She goes, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no, ma'am. She says, she comes back in, she starts telling the story. It was that lady. Is that right? I said, woman? I need to talk to you. I got some questions. Same husband? Yeah. I said, does he still believe in God? She goes, oh, yes, he does. I said, I didn't get to ask you before you left. Do you believe in God? She goes, oh, yes, I believe oh, in God. Right. And I said, so what you doing, church wife? She goes, oh, we're very involved in Lincoln Baptist Church, and we're just love God. And she says, all took place right here. Now, I don't know where that lady's going from here, but do you see how it works? Yeah. That's why I do it. The second reason I do it is because, see, for people to to hear the Holy Spirit, the brain's got to work good. And so if you want the brain to work well, use those eight laws I talked about. That makes the work, the brain work better. And when the brain works better, they can hear the Holy Spirit. Mm. And they can discern God's Word when you share the gospel with them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's why I do what I do. The God of the Bible is the God of good health. Absolutely. Like if a person hasn't been reading the Bible with, with eyes open to that, you start to read and you start to look about what the Bible says about health, it says an enormous amount about health. So uh, let me ask you this. When it comes to good health principles, what are some simple things that a lot of people are just missing? What are some that you would say, oh, this is fundamental, this is basic to good health? A lot of people, are just for whatever reason, they're not getting it. Can you think of any things? It's those eight laws, the eight things I mentioned. That's the foundation. Um, and it's a willingness to change. Just like if, if you were a smoker, you got to want to quit smoking. Do you want to be healthy? That, so that person needs to make a decision here to make that change. And that comes first. You, what, what, do you, what do you find motivates that person? So there's someone who's like, yeah, I'd... I'm 200 pounds overweight, but man, I just, I know everything you're saying is right, but I love this tub of ice cream and bag of M&Ms I eat every night before I go to bed. They know they should, but they don't really want to. How do you get a, how does a person get to the place they want to change? And then this is a little trickier. How do you help a family member to see that God has a better plan for them? You know, it's unfortunately, that person has a heart attack. You know, something major happens and they live through it. Yeah. Or they go in, the doc says, you know, you're, you got an occlusion, you know, uh, uh, you got the Widowmaker, you got whatever. And sometimes they're so severe that lifestyle change is too slow and they're going to have to have some, some work done in there yeah. by that surgeon. Um, but um, sometimes it's that. They they hit the wall, and um, or he may be a trucker, drives and he's going to lose his CDLs if he goes yeah. on the needle. Yeah, and so they usually have to hit the wall or about to hit the wall. Yeah, a friend of mine was overweight. He went to the doctor. The doctor said, "You are developing a serious disease. The only thing for you is to lose weight, or else." And so he did. He made some radical changes. Did fantastic. He barely recognized him. He lost a pile of weight. He suddenly was motivated, and there it was. But man, you don't want to wait until the doctor says the writing's on the wall. Not at all. No. And help me with that second question again. I don't know. <laughs> but that's okay. Let me ask you this question. Uh, and we're about at the, at the time where we need to start reviewing. So good lifestyle practices, following biblical teachings, following the eight natural laws, uh, not going crazy, but being sound and, and keeping yes. in touch with your doctor. 
We've already ascertained you can wind back diabetes. Mm -hmm. You can address all kinds of heart disease. Yes. You even spoke about MRSA, and I bet you that came as a surprise. What are some of the other things that, and we don't need to go into yeah, the house, sure. but what are some other things that, like, I didn't know that yeah. there's a way to address this n just through lifestyle. What are, what are some of those yeah. other things? Maybe might even surprise somebody. Let's say it's gout. Okay. And so, you know, can you plumb reverse it? You got to get to the cause. What's causing the gout? It could be, you know, we used to think it was just the red meat, but we're finding any of the meats is exacerbating it. it and any of the dried beans, you know, pinto beans, soup beans, lentils, Really? Yeah. Not good for gout? No. Beans is supposed to be good for everything. Yeah, but not gout. Oh. Yeah. Um, it could be oatmeal even could be a problem. Even brown rice could be a problem for that person. Yeah. Uh, it could be sugar. Sugar's huge. Alcohol, alcohol, sugar. Yeah. Uh, high fructose corn syrup. Sure. Is in so it's much. It's in everything these yeah. days. Yeah. And so you want to get that caused. And, and then we've known for years tart cherry juice. We use that when I worked in regular health care. Tart cherry juice, great. Uh, celery seeds, great. But you, again, you want to find what's that cause. You got to, the cure is in the cause. So you, you find out what's causing it, remove that. You know, I went total vegetarian. I grew up on a dairy farm. Yeah. And then we went beef cattle. And I'd given up beef because of what I saw in the stockyards. Yeah. Huh? Uh, I saw what we took stockyards when they were sick, you know. And so, but dairy was so hard for me. And finally, I, my gastroenterologist said, well, you're going to die. Plum, you're going to die. He said, your colon has no intact tissue in it. No, Ooh. period. And um, he said, we might be able to take your colon out, see if we can help you, but you're not doing good. And so I thought, dying's not, let me check out somebody else. Yeah. And so I, uh, uh, somebody you probably, I'm sure know, uh, a cardiologist, uh, we'd had dinner before, two years before, uh, and uh, he'd had some issues. And uh, so I went to somebody he went to. Six months, I was totally healed. I gave up dairy, and dairy is a big part of it. And it took six months to heal that colon, but now I've been 22 years with, without yeah, any problems. And so sometimes you have to get to that root cause, take that root cause away, and then you're okay. Can't thank you enough, this has been a joy. I think you've offered a lot of hope, a lot of wisdom, a lot of scientifically based counsel, and my hope and prayer is that uh, you've pointed a lot of people in the right direction. You are going to be busy traveling and teaching and speaking and counseling, and you do an awful lot in your community. You run a business there, and uh, thank the Lord He keeps bringing people to you to help. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. This has been a real blessing. This has been a blessing. I'm glad you have not missed this blessing, um, and I hope that you've picked up something that's going to be a, a practical help to you as you move forward. I'm John Bradshaw. He is Walt Cross. This has been our conversation.